Imagine waiting two weeks to know if you got a like or not, or a thumbs up. In the decades before the internet, people made comics, and we reached out to each other. What was it like? This is the Sequential Artists Workshop, and these are the 90s mini comics oral history archives. Okay, so um, would you like to start by saying your name and some of your history in comics? Uh, sure. Um, my name is Tom Hart. Um, in uh, the 90s, I was making lots of mini comics. I think I made uh, just five or six or seven, which seemed like a lot. Um, uh, the the self-published mini comics were um, silly names like Prince Frederick's Feet, Wadabi, Love Looks Left, uh, Angry Criminal. Um, I forget. And they've, they, those have all been um, uh, um, compiled in a collection called uh, She's Not Into Poetry. Oh, I made lots of 24-hour comics too. At least three in the 90s, but maybe more like four or five. Oh, I made one called Ramadan also. I forgot about that one. I like that one a lot. Might be my favorite. Um, and then I made two professional, sort of professional comics in that time, Hacho and, and New Hat, and then something called The Sands. But if we're focusing on just self-published, those are the other ones. Where Whereabouts were you working during that time, like kind of geographically? Um, a lot of that was Seattle, Washington, and... Um, and then some of it, including a couple of the mini, a couple of the 24 hour comics, uh, was um, Austin, Texas. And then I did Ramadan in, in Morocco, where I was for five months. And then the Sands also, well, I guess the Sands isn't about self published. So that wasn't self published. Um, so, yeah, essentially Seattle and a little bit of Austin, Texas. Mm -hmm. As far as self published stuff, so I was working as a cartoonist in also in Boston and um, Morocco and Gainesville, Florida, but I think I was only self-publishing in Austin and Seattle, mini comics anyway. That's really interesting. Maybe we can talk about that um, after we talk about some of the questions we have here already, but um, I wanted to ask, when did you first start seeing evidence of other people making comics or specifically in that self-publishing realm? Um, yeah, I think the first one I saw was um, a friend of mine. Oh, he wasn't my, really my friend. I sort of met him and saw his comics at the same time, Sam Henderson. Uh, I grew up in Kingston, New York, and he grew up in Woodstock, New York, which is a few towns over, and, and, his, and that's like a creative happy place and Kingston was like a creative asshole and, and so like I was working at the comic book store and um and I got that job because I just slowly started becoming aware of comics and um and so I and, and Sam came in with his mini comics and was like I, I'm pretty sure I'm remembering this right it was like can I sell these and I, and I was like whoa who, who are you what is this and those comics were called um Captain Spaz and um who, who Pert Herman? I think, and Pert Herman was this character who had a, a skateboard for feet and uh, poked people's eyes out. <laughs> anyway, so but Sam Henderson's comics were the first, the first that I saw that were like self published, and and um and he at that point you know he we uh, we would have been sixteen possibly seventeen, but he'd been doing them for four or five years at that point, and I never it never even occurred to me to self publish ever. I had so like, like the early nineties or. I would be 86 or seven. Okay. So it was on your radar for a while before you kind of considered it for yourself. I didn't self-publish until fall of 87 at the School of Visual Arts where Sam and I both went. I can't even remember if that was, I think, I don't think that was the design. Interestingly, I never really, I'm not even sure, but we both went to the School of Visual Arts where um that was one of the only places if not the only place to get a cartooning degree um and and study with uh, uh harvey kurtzman and uh, will eisner and some others and um and so i hadn't self-published even even until i got to school and so sam and i with another guy mark arsenal made a anthology called tuna casserole 
and I had maybe a page in it or a page and, and like maybe collaborated a tiny bit on the cover. At the maximum, I had two pages in it. And from there, I think I did an eight page comic that was just spot illustrations. That took, that felt like that took, it was impossible. Like that was really difficult <laughs> to do eight single drawings and compile it. It was just all new to me. It was all new. And, um, and also I wasn't really, um, confident creatively you know I didn't know if I if I was allowed to participate in this sort of like ecosystem you know this with this world that had already existed people making mini comics and trading them and stuff so I was very tentative my first steps um it sounds like Sam was like a big inspiration for you are there any other examples of like comics or interactions that surprised or inspired you at that time period um Mark Arsenal uh, who is now the head of uh, something called Wow Cool and Alternative Comics? He he was my studio partner at uh, SVA, um, which meant that we had separate uh, bedrooms, but we shared a studio. And um, he was a terrible studio partner and <laughs> uh, overflowed and controlled the space. Um, but so he, Sam, and I um, collaborated on that anthology. Mark was always creating something quality didn't seem to matter although it would take me decades to realize that quality didn't seem to matter <laughs> um sam was a little more measured he was often he wasn't as prolific as mark but he his things were like um finished they were complete stories um whereas whereas mark was always making stickers like one pagers that would Become, that would you just get pasted up somewhere or sketchbook comics and stuff like that where Sam was Sam was always working on something to be finished so those two were very inspiring again this is late 80s this is 87 88 um, um that was all my inspiration until I until I met uh John Lewis through the mail um I guess through fact sheet five um and he was living in Minneapolis at the time, um, but uh, he was talking about moving to Seattle, um, which was where Fanographics was located and where there were a lot of cartoonists. And so he and I moved to Seattle within months of each other. He, he went there first. That would be about 90, 90. That's amazing. So it sounds like a lot of peer-to-peer -peer kind of um, feedback and like exposure to things. Um, did you ever read Fact Sheet 5 in the 80s or 90s? Yeah, you said that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I'm not, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I don't, it's weird because I'm not sure how I knew to look for it. Mark probably actually, kind of think of it. Mark and Sam would have said, would have had some Fact Sheet 5s around. And then after I dropped out of college, so I sort of went my own way, I guess I still had some old issues or I ordered a couple at some point I found John through there or he I must have found it because I don't think I was in fact sheet five yet so I must have found him through there I guess if we interviewed John he might say totally otherwise because his, his memory is better than mine and Sam's is great um for people who don't know what fact sheet five is do you want to tell like describe what it is and what its function was yeah fact sheet five was uh um maybe four times a year, maybe even six times a year, uh, catalog of reviews of comics. It was basically a central clearinghouse, or not clearinghouse, but a centralized place for um, finding out about mini comics. So if you made a mini comic, and maybe you made 100 copies, maybe you made 20, you would send one to Fact Sheet 5, so they would put it in the catalog, hopefully. Not a catalog, review sheet, review zine, I don't know what to call it, magazine. And then that would come out every couple of months and you'd see it and you'd just pour over and look for the interesting ones. This sounds interesting. Very little artwork was ever reproduced occasionally. Um, but if, but the, hopefully the, the, um, the write-up was clear, you know, oh, this is kind of like strange, quirky. Uh, you know, I'm sure they wrote up John's stuff as very, you know, quirky and smart and strange. And that's probably why I was like, oh, I want this, you know? <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, so that's what Fact Sheet 5 was. And, um, so that's, I'm, I'm certain that's how I met John Lewis. And then we started corresponding through the mail. Um, yeah. 
Did you ever advertise or have one of your comics reviewed in it? Yeah, I think so. I don't. I didn't advertise. Um, I don't think. Um, yeah, I can't remember how many of mine got reviewed. They're all. They're all on archive.org, and so I've been meaning to pour through them and see if I can find my name. But um, it takes a lot of work. I haven't done that yet. Um, but I know I would have put a couple things in there. Probably my first thing, which was a, which was called art and offerings. That was the thing that was just eight illustrations, and um, and maybe the others too. I, I'm not even sure. I corresponded with a lot of people, like a lot of people who did nail art and like rubber stamp art and stuff. I was really into that kind of thing. And um, we found, we would have found each other through Fact Sheet 5. And also sometimes like, like somebody would say, oh, you need to, I can't remember the name of the woman who was a real rubber stamp nail artist, but a lot of times it'd be like, you need to correspond with so-and-so send her a postcard or send her a bunch of stamps and she'll send you some really cool things. And, and then sort of friendship started that way too. I want to hear more about community, but before we get to that, is it okay if we talk a little bit about production? Sure. Sure. Um, how were you making comics at the time? Like what tools were you using? Uh, I, well, I've always, always used dip pen and ink ever since I, you know, took a, a lot of uh, um, comic uh, what I'm trying to say, uh, cartooning books out of library and stuff like that as a kid. So that was how it was done back then. So that's how I did it. Um, Zipatone when I could find it, but I usually photocopied. Zipatone was really expensive. It, was, it would be like $11 for like a sheet like that. And But if you went down to the copy store and photocopied it, you could get an okay reproduction of it for a dollar a sheet or $2 a sheet. But it really wasn't perfect, and so it was kind of gross, and also it would smear. <laughs> but that's what I, so pen and ink and uh, smearable smearing um, uh, mechanical uh, uh, shading film. Um, yeah, that's what I almost always worked in. And that was just like on Bristol board, or what kind of paper were you using? More often than not, it was on Bristol board. Yeah, I might. I think I, I occasionally was a tiny bit. Ex experimental and that would like me I think I did one in in like grease pencil on regular typing paper but I think I did that because I saw Adrian Tomina's comics and I liked his sort of soft line am I remembering that right I'm not sure I think I saw something that was reproduced that way but yeah almost always ink on paper and then you would shrink it down and make a mock-up take the mock-up to the photocopy store and then just make your copies Amazing. So it's like very lo-fi um, on the on the copy machine. Mm -hmm. um, do you remember how many you printed of your first comic? No. I tended to think in round numbers, so maybe a hundred now and then. Not not the first first comic. I don't know. Certainly not much. Okay, but that's changed over time. Now you're like sending like a thousand off to the printer. Like, how is it different oh, now? My UB is dying now. That's like a hundred, also, <laughs> which is why I run out. Um, one hundred fifty, maybe. But when I did, when I did, when I self-published with um, uh, a professional sort of at an offset printer in nineteen ninety-three or four, I think it was four. That was Hutch Owens working hard. I did three thousand of those because that was like a decent minimum that the printer could handle. And I have no idea where those wound up. I'm pretty sure. They wound up, they wound up at Michelle Vrana's warehouse, and then, and then got lost to time. I don't know how many of them I sold, but certainly not three thousand. Right, but like kind of the constraints were about like the printing process. Mm -hmm. That makes a lot of sense. Do you remember um, at that time kind of how you just dist distributed your work? How how are you trading or selling comics? Well, we'd um. Well, uh, I can't remember when SPX started, but we do it at festivals. Um, also, friends in Seattle, you know, there were always 20 or 30 cartoonists around. So we would meet up and trade or go to a party with 10 copies in our hands or something like that. Um, and then anybody you were you were in correspondence with in the mail. Um, and um, yeah, you would send some out they would trade trade i was never that super worried about money so i don't remember how many people paid and how many people i traded with um uh yeah and maybe i put it in fact sheet five i can't remember i was mostly just interested in 
um, showing my friends, you know, in, in Seattle, we had a real tight knit community. So like, I just wanted to have something for them, but also conventions. I can't remember when SPX started. I'm sure that information's out there because that would have been one of my first conventions. Although I did go to the San Diego con in 94 and then again in 95 and never again. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, and we didn't have really like zine fairs or anything. Do you remember like any specific comics or artists that you were kind of trading with at the time? Is there any like story that stands out for you? Well, I liked really weird things. I don't know if they seemed weird to anyone else. I mean, they didn't seem weird to me is what I'm trying to say. Like, but like there was a guy named Matt Webin who did this thing called Walking Man Comics and it was mostly rubber stamped. And it, I think, yeah, it was rubber stamps and it was just this rubber stamp of a guy walking. And um, uh, and it would just be musing about things like that. And I remember corresponding with him. I really liked that comic. I always liked impressing Dave Lasky, who was in, in Seattle. So if I could impress him with a comic, I was really happy. Um, and then my other friends, Megan Kelso and Jason Lutz and um, John and James Sturm. And, and I, I don't know, a lot of those five or six were really important to me, like, like getting, sort of getting their approval. Um, as far as like, yeah, I don't even know where, I don't remember what I, where a lot of the other comics would wind up. There was a skateboard shop. I mean, well, it, this is was, all. What? Well, I was just, I wanted to say this is all pre-internet. So I wanted to like focus on like how y'all are communicating. You, you weren't always in the same place. Like you're kind of jumping between Seattle. SBX is based out of. Washington. Um, DC. So like, how were y'all keeping in touch if you weren't in the same room? Um, well, all of us Seattle people would, you know, we'd call each other and, and meet up a lot and whether it was a cafe or our own living room and we had like monthly meeting actually official meetings um we do 24-hour comics and other and just hang out in each other's rooms so that, that that was easy but as far as other people it was it would have been through the mail i still remember my p.o box it was p.o box 95973 seattle washington 98103 actually now i'm not sure about this nine eight one four five anyway <laughs> I think uh, you cut, I cut you off when you were about to describe like a place that was kind of important for, for sharing and meeting up. Oh yeah, the skateboard shop and record shop. And it's a shame that I can't remember the name of it because first of all, they were great. Second of all, I, I worked there sometimes <laughs> when they needed uh, help. It was uh, called, uh, boy, everybody in Seattle is going to be pissed off that I can't remember this. Anyway, Seattle, uh, Seattle Skateboard and Record Shop. They were really instrumental. Like when, when grunge happened, like people would buy their 45s there and they had a real good um, really relationship with Sub Pop. And um, I started with an F. What the hell was it called? Um, that's so funny. Uh, but, you know, you'd put your mini comics there also. That, you know, maybe you had a relationship with a couple stores across the country that maybe you'd already gone to. Like, I remember I traveling the country I dropped off a couple at Quimby's which was around back then in Chicago pretty sure it was Quimby's um uh, I'm trying to remember other places you know uh if you did travel you'd try and find those kinds of stores and drop off a few of your copies and maybe keep in touch with them maybe not <laughs> just hope that somebody found them <laughs> Um, so it sounds like very like hand to hand kind of distribution. Were you ever using like a formal kind of structure or a collective? Well, John Porcelino started spit and a half distribution at some point, but I don't remember when. I think my stuff would have been in the first catalog, some of those catalogs, maybe in the certainly the mid 90s. Um, so, so that's something. John would be an important person to interview because I'm not really sure when all that stuff happened and or if he's got archives of some of those early catalogs or anything but, but he was always very into uh disseminating and getting people's stuff out there um so yeah i would have been in there but i don't think i made it into any other zine distro systems which is never really um that aggressive about getting the stuff out there 
Hutch Owens' work in hard went through Diamond Comics, but that's because it was published um, professionally, and that was the whole point. But everything else was, yeah, through the mail or with John Porcelino at parties. One of my one of my comics I did specifically for a party. Um, that comic was called Wodabi, and and the party was to welcome Julie Doucet, who was moving to town. She was moving to Seattle, and I was like, I want to have something to give to Julie, so I made that comic. Mm. There you go. That's amazing. I feel like it kind of leads back into some of the things you were mentioning before about community and the the people you were close to, and maybe the people you admired. Julie to say, is there anyone else on that list? Julie was um, the biggest inspiration as far as somebody who wasn't um, who I wasn't super, you know, who wasn't one of my best friends. I, I became mm -hmm. friendly enough with Julie to play poker with her and stuff, but. Um, but as far as an inspiration, she was the biggest because she was just fearless on the page and she would just take just everything human about her and it would just wind up in black and white on the page. And it just, it's harder to, it's hard to describe, but it's, to me, there wasn't another artist that close to doing that. Maybe Chester Brown, maybe mm -hmm. Robert Crumb, um, maybe Dave Lasky, honestly, sometimes in that they were broad in what they saw in themselves and what they put on the page um, and uh, sort of fearless about putting stuff down. What was the question? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I think that's a great answer. Um, I guess you mentioned the first convention you went to and you've been talking about different places where you felt connected. Is there like a particular time or place where you felt like the most connected to, to community and to comics? Well, Seattle for sure. You know, I'm remembering though that also like, you know, you would, you would meet people, you would meet people through friends too, right? So I became pretty friendly with Joe Cipetta. Joe Cipetta I would have met through John Porcelino. John Porcelino I would have met through whomever because everybody knew John and by me I mean trade comics in the mail with you know and stuff like that and um so the first one of the first SPXs I remember finally getting to meet Joe Cipetta for instance and that was really fun and kind of crazy and um I felt very you know very welcome at that first SPX which was was terrific um what did what did the first SPX look like how I mean, you were you were just there in September for the 2022 SBX. How how was it different from that first one? Oh, just a little smaller. They're more <laughs> more like a, uh, nicely produced banners now, you know. But they're just smaller. Um, maybe more pretty prints now, and uh, you know, more people with like little stuffed figurines and stickers and stuff I don't know my memory isn't that good for those kinds of things that's fair. Uh, but I remember um but I remember you know meeting people and who we uh, uh you know just how just sort of how people were like for instance Joe Geppetto who I mentioned was really um uh, crazy about selling so he would sell his comics he always had his comics with him and I mean always like if he was in the bathroom he had his comics with him and he's trying to sell them to you like anywhere you run into him he's trying to sell you his comics and, and he did pretty well for a while that way I mean not well but I mean he got his name out there and he got his books into people's hands and it got the you know I don't know maybe he made money too I'm not really sure um I guess I also have a question about whether there was a time, like a period during this time. So you've been talking about like the mid eighties, late eighties through the nineties. Was there, was there a time you felt the least connected to comics or to community or was like, it was always something you were seeking out and was available to you? Yeah, and every time I moved, I, there was always a, a community. Like there was a community in Austin, Texas. That's where I met Matt Madden. Um, and uh when I was in Morocco, even though it was only five months, I was furiously trying to um, make comics. I made a, I did a lot of work then and um, was in, you know, was working the post office too, you know, keeping in touch with John Lewis and keeping in touch with other people. 
keeping in touch even with my publisher at the time of that was being published by Black Eye Publishing. Um, and then I moved after, um, let's see, and then in Gainesville, that was where Jeff Mason was based and he was publishing in, uh, uh, indie comics. That's what it was called, indie comics. And um, and then when I moved to Boston, there were a lot of, lot of cartoonists in Boston. So I was always in a cartooning town. Maybe they all were cartooning town. <laughs> These are big cities where even Gainesville was. Um, so yeah, I never really felt that disconnected. I started to feel disconnected maybe in, I don't know, it's time, more about time than place actually. Like sort of in the mid 2000s, I realized I wasn't, um, uh, wasn't being like written about anymore, <laughs> you know? And uh, I mean, that's also like the technological shift as well. Like I'm sure there's a lot that could be investigated there. I think it's a generational shift too that isn't obvious when you're a young cartoonist. Wow, there's really bright light here, huh? Maybe I should change that, or maybe it's perfect. Um, um, you know, I think there's a generational shift that happens, and when you're in the sort of like the up and coming generation, you feel really excited and really connected. And then uh -huh. as as newer um, as newer generations sort of sort of take over, you realize you're not as connected because you don't know the new people. Um, and you can work to stay connected, I guess, but I don't know. It's just some some amount of disconnection that happens naturally, I think. Um, Did that change your practice? Because, I mean, you're describing, like, during that time in Seattle, being in the same room with people. Did that kind of lead to collaborations or, or jams in that space? We didn't do much in the way of traditional jams, but we did do much in the way of, like, I'll write this and you draw that and stuff. Actually, we did some jams. But, um, but it, I mean, you mean later or you mean in Seattle I mean in that prime time where you're feeling connected and like you describe it as like up and coming you're... yeah we we did a little but mostly we they were like purposely experimental but like a lot of us were more interested in following our own our own um muse you know and figuring out how to best enable each other to to sort of be original and be um and to do the things that made the most sense to them, right? So like when we got together, it was mostly to encourage each other to be in the same room. Um, it wasn't a lot of, at least, in, at least to me, there wasn't a lot of collaborating. Sometimes it was official collaborating, like when Ed Brubaker and Jason Lutz collaborated on a story together. Ed wrote it, Jason drew it. Uh, but mostly, you know, Megan worked on her comics. John worked on his comics. I worked on mine. Dave worked. Dave, Dave was a collaborator, actually. Dave was... He would collaborate with people. Okay, I have just a few more questions and then we can wrap up. Um, okay. Do you miss anything about that time? Um, well, I wish Sorry, John... my neighbor's vacuum cleaner is like in the hallway. <laughs> I can't hear it. Uh, I, was about to, I was about to crankily say, I wish John would answer my texts more often. Um, um, uh no I mean honestly like one reason I founded this school was to have this like community around me of creators and cartoonists I I absolutely was passionate for it and loved it and, and felt very inspired by it and um I, I kept it around me <laughs> the people have changed a little you know but but I've tried to keep keep a comic making community around me at all times yeah and and in New York, in the interim between, you know, in the in the first decade of the two thousands, I was still very in, immersed in the, that particular New York comic scene. There are a lot of New York comic scenes, but that particular one, which was me and Matt Madden and Jessica Abel for sure, and Leela, um, and um, and some of uh, and some of the teachers at SVA and stuff, Matt. And Jessica ran some programs. There was one called Comics Decode, which was mostly a performance uh, series of comics performances. After a while, I started running these things in the KGB bar, but this is the 2000s. And, uh, and um, that would, uh, I did those twice a year. I did readings for five or six years where I ran the readings and we'd have three or four people come in and read comics at the bar. It was super fun. So in, in other words, I always had things like that happening. 
whereas others sort of retreated. Ed retreated and became a, um, you know, writer for Marvel and DC. And um, uh, Megan's always done her thing, but but pretty slowly and pretty much kept to herself. Dave, likewise, is sort of always doing something, but keeps kind of keeps to himself. Um, but me, I don't know. Maybe I'm maybe I'm more of a social animal than I thought. So I always always work to keep people around me. Is there anything you don't miss about the, that time? No, I really like it. I think, I think, I mean, I, I especially these days, I'm, I, I'm talking about like, uh, I'm talking with myself about um, cell phones, especially in digital communication, but especially like um, social media and, and email and, and in very harsh terms. I think it's kind of ruined a lot of <laughs> my ability to concentrate and, uh, and and uh, think and so um, I don't miss those methods. I'm, but I'm I'm I, I'm not a luddite, but I am a. But I do think um, there's a lot to be said for doing things um, slowly and with more effort than you want. You know, like it's okay that it, we had to communicate through the mail. You know, and it's although you know, I think I think the de democratization that's happened with digital media and social and social media and stuff is, is really great. And the, the people for whom they went from having no voice to now having a voice, I think that's, that's irreplaceable. But for me, um, it feels more like, uh, I, I went from having focus to be constantly distracted. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's a different kind of engagement with your work, right? Because I've I've seen in the SOAR archives, there are there are letters, there are the exchanges you had with other artists and engagement with the subject matter in the process. And that's just like the kind of feedback there are. Yeah. <laughs> I have to photocopy some of those or, or post them or something. Yeah. I can dig back in. Um, okay, tell us. Tell us one more memory, one one thing that you want to be archived forever. Oh, um, uh, let's see, what are we talking about? 90s mini comics? Mm -hmm. Self-publishing, pre-internet. Uh, I met my uh, wife, Leela Corman, at a mini comics festival. And uh, it was uh, arranged by Tom Devlin in Cambridge, Massachusetts. It was 97, yeah. And uh, and it was a, called the Comic Cambridge Comic Circus, and it was a cartoonist doing um, non-cartooning things, so like puppet shows and music acts, but not a lot of rock and roll and um, and other stuff like that. And uh, and again, like you heard about that through the mail, <laughs> or how did we hear about that comic journal? I mean, let's see. I mean, I maybe I had an email address by then. I don't know. I don't remember how we heard about it, but. Um, you know, back then things could go wrong. You know, you'd show up somewhere on the wrong day or stuff like that. It was pretty easy to do. But anyway, I got there on the right day. But um, but after doing a really bad job of my performance, I um uh wait, what was your performance? Were you the puppet show? It was a it was a sock puppet performance of um this light's intense. Should I keep it or should I shut that blind? I think it's wonderful. Keep going. <laughs> It was a sock puppet performance of um, Samuel Beckett's one man play called um, Crap's Last Tape. So Crap's Last Tape is a is a um, a man on his birthday, he's old, he's listening to recordings that he makes every year on his birthday. So it's mostly a guy listening to himself talk, but not really talking, or a little bit he's talking. And it's a very inappropriate play to make with a sock puppet. It was utterly boring and a complete washout in, in performance so it was I didn't really understand anything about performing then not that I do now but I certainly a little more um so uh anyway that's what I did for that 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 show and um I can't remember if I met Leela right before I went on stage or right after but I do know that right that afterwards I bombed so much that I you know got a little bit drunk and um and then talked 
talked with her quite a bit more after that. I think I talked to her before because Jessica Abel was the hostess of that or the MC of that show. And, and she was trying to fill time. So she said, uh, does anyone, anyone have a joke? And Leela said, I have a joke. So Leela went up on stage and uh, she says, I need a volunteer. And I was like, oh, she's cute. I'll volunteer. And, um, and so I volunteered and Leela told this incredibly corny joke, which I'm not going to repeat here just because it takes too much time. And, um, and then, yeah, and then after the show, we wound up talking all night. And there's actually an interesting, again, lo-fi communication story that's worth telling, which is, which is we spent most of the next day together, but most of that day um, was spent with me looking for a plane ticket that I'd lost the previous night. And so I was like driving around Boston, asking friends, looking into other people's cars and coats, trying to find this ticket. So I was supposed to go to Portugal the next day for this comic book convention. And uh, I never found it. Eventually, what I had to do is go to their, the plane, the, air, uh, the, <clears throat> the airline offices, which were not in the airport. They were downtown. And I gave them lots of paperwork and all sorts of stuff. But I managed to get on that flight. But after it was after spending hours and hours and hours looking for that plane ticket that I utterly... Um, couldn't find <laughs> that, I mean, that I don't miss it is nice to not worry too much about losing a plane ticket or something like that <laughs> thanks for thanks for that thank you for sharing that story that being the anecdote you wanted to share I think there's a lot a lot to dig in there um <laughs> but it kind of reaches the end of our list and now time um so if you don't have anything else you want to add we might wrap it up there no, but uh, but maybe if I have any more, you guys can send me a link or something, and I can upload more or something. Perfect. Um, before before I stop recording, would you like to play something? <laughs> well, that, I mean, get, I'm getting a little bit closer to. Let's see. Oops. Oops. If somebody heard me playing this, they'd be they'd be shocked. Not not because I can't play it well, but because I take liberties. Like leaving that note playing for so long, it was really bad. It wasn't that note, you know. And and whoops. up with uh, Against All Odds by Phil Collins in, a, in my head yesterday and I thought oh I can play I can probably play that and I went on YouTube and it's incredibly difficult so I'm not going to be playing um, so how was that I can play uh... oops Be, uh, before everybody's time. Um, <laughs> I'll stop recording. <laughs> yeah.